Hello friends, my name is David McLeod and I am your life mastery coach and best-selling lead author of the brand new book, Gifts of Wisdom, Practices for Healing and Empowerment, which is now available on Amazon at the link below. Welcome to this chapter reading sessions for, for my book in which you get to meet each author and listen in during a personal reading of that person's entire chapter from this amazing and beautiful book. Today, my guest is Frank Byram, contributor of chapter 17. Frank Byram is an inventor, scientist, technologist, and best-selling author who has spent the last four decades on a powerful spiritual journey. Today, his daily practice includes tea, breathwork, prayer and meditation, martial arts, Qigong, and wisdom studies. And he shares this wisdom generously in the world. Welcome, Frank, and thank you so much for joining me today for this session. How are you doing? I'm doing great, David. Thank you very much for having me. It's just a lot of fun doing the book and uh, looking forward to reading the chapter as well. Yeah. I, I've noticed, I mean, all of the authors have very, very unique ways of sharing their wisdom. And I was touched by your style because you happen to write in a way that I like to write. It's kind of a what I would call a poetic fashion. I, I really like that. So tell us a little bit about that. What's that poetic fashion all about? Well, you know, um, Laura, who's our publisher, talks a lot about, uh, you know, tell not show, you know, um, and um, so I'm trying, or show not tell, I'm trying to get you where I am. And in this particular one, just a little little hint, is uh, um, you'll, you'll hear this, what's going on in my mind as I am writing the chapter. So you will... The chapter uh, goes back and forth from the actual things that I'm thinking and what's going on, and and the the theme of the wisdom story at this point. So you'll you'll get a sense of of what's going on uh, through the chapter, and that's not unlike our minds. Like it's right. not like not like, not like we we don't sit and just like think one thing all the time. And if we're meditating or talking or or whatever we're doing at work, there are things that kind of pop up as we're as we're doing those things and and to to the extent that i could explain that so people can see that this is really what goes on and it is actually part of the spiritual journey that i'm um hoping to for people to to understand so right right yeah thank you for that explanation i'm kind of curious so frank uh, um you and i had never met before so i'm kind of curious how how was it that you uh were inspired what called you to be part of this book in the first place well, you know, there there is something near and dear to my heart, and that is is wisdom teachings, or you know, ancient teachings, or elder wisdom, or however you want to talk about it. It's one of the things I study uh, as part of my daily inspiration. And of course, you know, I'd love to add to that, uh, not not just that genre, but to others uh, to benefit from our advanced age at this point in our lives, but to benefit from some of the the pieces that are going on. Uh, this story came out of what for me was a uh, it felt like a, a a life collapse and reset and i've talked to many people and in fact i talk often to people who are in the middle of that or are just starting that and and the questions are almost the same you know uh, is there hope uh, does it get better you know will i will i find another love will i find another job will i will you know will whatever and very I think the thing I'd want people to understand from this story is uh, likely what you're feeling. 99.9% .9 is human feelings. We mm -hmm. all feel them. You live long enough, you'll probably go through some some number of these uh, you know, valleys and what you're feeling is human. And once you understand that it's, it's, it's not so lonely, once you understand that it's not just you who are feeling you're not the only person then maybe you can find those who've navigated through or find you know reach out to me reach out to you and you know we'll help help you sort of navigate through that that time because that's how we all got through is we had friends family mentors help us navigate through and i think it's important that we pass that along um to the younger generations and maybe to a few people our age and a little bit older but <laughs> yeah that's really the Oh, here, you know. 
Yeah, right. I, I like that. And, you know, a, a phrase comes to my mind right now. I believe it's originally a Buddhist phrase, this too shall pass. Of course, Buddha or whoever said that didn't mean this, this shall pass instantaneously. It just meant <clears throat> all of these things. It's like clouds in the sky. They might hang around for a while, but eventually the clouds do clear and the sun shows its, its beautiful warmth and rays again. And I think the same is true for, you know, the human feelings. We can think of them as clouds sometimes that block us or maybe not block us, but uh, get in the way of our, our feeling, our true essence, our true, beautiful, natural uh, bliss and, and joy that's in there. And when we sit with it and let it pass on its own, all of a sudden it's like the clouds opening up. Yeah. Absolutely. That's an almost all wisdom tradition. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bible, which is a very American tradition for many people, it, it, and it came to pass. Same same idea, um, right. and you know, and we got bought by it. I have a, a nephew who says, you know, it is what it is, and yeah. that tends to. But but there's some truth to that. Um, denying the reality is a good deal of the of the pain that we ex, we experience, and and it's all grief at some level. We're grieving the circumstances right. until we until we can step onto that that stone or two of hope and and move forward and uh, so that's my hope for this um that people will get hope from it and and realize that there is a path out you know it's, right. it's not rarely is it permanent you know yeah. rarely it is, it's rare, rarely it feels like it it feels like the last days. It feels like you'll never be happy again. It, it certainly feels like all those things. I've been through that a few times in my life. And yet the reality is um, much different. Um, I will say this, the thing that got me the greatest hope most of, most to most of all those things is the belief that my best days or my best blessings or my best whatever is ahead of me. And oddly yeah. enough, that's always been true. I can't yeah. explain it. I'm not saying that I'm a millionaire or, you know, I don't have any troubles. I'm just saying that, oddly enough, I have found amazing blessings and amazing things always in my future as I, as I step towards it. So it's, yeah. it's important. To well, that's a beautiful message to share. And without any further delay, I'd like to invite you to read your chapter. And let me just say this, friends. This, I want you to just kind of take a breath and bring yourself present and give yourself permission to listen to Frank Byram as he reads chapter 17, Starting Again, a spiritual practice for moving from collapse to hope. My story. On the whisper of a spring breeze, the smell of mint was the aroma, clean, refreshing, and clearing. Deep breath, inhale, slowly, one, two, hold, one, two, exhale, one, two, inhale, sweet basil, memory sleepily drifting to pesto with garlic, no, 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 caprizi salad, yum, breathe in slowly, no, slower, slower, my shoulders fall and the relaxation ripples down my spine. The floral woodsy herbal smell of lavender. Focus drifting, a tiny buzz, then two and more, a chorus, no a symphony, just over the fence. There's an ancient tradition known by many names. Joseph Campbell said it was the hero's journey to follow your bliss. Richard Rohr ascertained in his book titled Falling Upwards. From Homer's Iliad and Odyssey to modern times, the narrative is likely as old as human history, retold for generations around a nightly flame. Breathe out, slower, and now slower. One, two, three, four. A sip, mm, spring grass and floral and mild, mildly astringent. A 2024 Indian Darjeeling First flush, picked early spring, after the winter and before the monsoons. The early birds are chirping, and the sun has yet to cast the long shadows of the morning. Breathe in. No, slower. 
slower, no, slower. Somewhere between the sleepy awake from, dream, from the dream world and the real day, the thinning of the veil, each morning starts with ritual. Often events of years or days past stream past my thoughts like an odd, twisted, and seemingly unrelated tapestry. My belief, the spilling over of the unconscious mind into the transitioning to waking. How the hell does a 16-year-old write a computer language? A memory from my junior year of university meeting a new student, John, days before class. He's clicking away in a computer lab, alone. I feel so dumb. Many traditions recount the same truth, found in the Vedas, the Tao Te Ching, the Gateless Gate, the Gnostics, the Bible with the Apocrypha, the same old story, rinse and repeat, Adam, Enoch, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, David, Jesus, Peter, Paul. The narrative structure is essential to the basic template of life's journey, how it works and how it breaks, the mountain highs and the deepest valley, the lesson, the heartbreak, the reality. Isaac's son Jacob is an exceptional example as well as Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Breathe out. No, it's still slower. Congratulations for shipping your first software. I can see my embarrassment of recognition as I downplay the attention. Although I am ashamed to admit it, there was a crack of a hidden smile upon my lips. Life's journey unfolds in three simple vignettes, often repeated seemingly in loops, as each essential lesson is learned, forgotten, and relearned with nuance. Phase one, building identity and ego. Life essentially starts from this for the same for everyone, birth, domestication by parents, and family and extended family, socialization by close friends and family and society, and sometimes religion and other cultural artifacts. I was raised an obedient, disciplined, studious, hardworking, conservative Southern Baptist. Rules, do's, don'ts, sin, hell. Where's the love and grace? Then comes early grade school and the early cruelty of children teasing, which seems to continue in different forms throughout life. I was different, soft, reflective, and intuitive. Punished into a desired mold, secretly my soul seemed to have little in common with my parents' microcosm. Middle school was worse. My sense is that those early teachers often become bullies and worse as life unfolds into adulthood. I'll pick Bobby. Oh, three left. Pick me. Please pick me. I'll pick Frank. Breathe out. I visualize my uncomfortable smile and the emotional relief not being picked last. Breathe in. For my early years, for the early years of psychological development and through the through the first 20, maybe mid-30s, the essential identity is formed and solidified. Through your family, your friends, your school, especially high school and university, uh, what religious and political be beliefs. For Jacob, Isaac's son, his identity is associated with the God of my father, Abraham, and the God of my father, Isaac. You see what's missing? What about Jacob's God? It was his father's God, not his God. And that often sums up my early development. It was my parents' everything, and I had to unlearn and earn my everything. In the parable, the prodigal son, seemingly unhappy with his life, said to his father, give me my inheritance, his identity, a rich kid looking for adventure. Which is the way Jacob, when he ran from his brother Esau, a distant memory, where are your pictures? I flipped over the endless rows of faces, embarrassed. I was a guy who was missing throughout the high school annual. As the fourth child, there are few pictures of me before I became an adult. I was creative, curious, and a deep observer. I was different, very different, and asked different questions 
nominally pointing out the hypocrisy and the rule ignoring of all those godly friends and my parents. Science, you're good in science, and that's what you should be your focus in, Mom. Breathe out. A long, slow sigh. The memories flood into my meditation, and I press into the agonizing flow. Prussian era parents have no use for creatives and less for intuitives. For a moment, realizing my breathing, I pause, attempting to hold back the torture. Breathe in, slower, longest yet. Word spells, yes, word spells. In youth, we begin to receive such spells in its lifelong endeavor to identify these limiting beliefs and reverse each. I believe many word spells versus trusting my heart and intuition. Remember, domestication? Mr. Barham, it appears that you have bled on this essay. Uh, Mr. Pro Holbrook said in 10th grade English, I told myself, I'm never going to be a writer. Sure, I could write technical, but anything else? No. This was my nearly 40 year word spell. I broke during COVID when I took my first adult writing class. The goal of those first 30 ish years is to identify is to build and identify the ego with all the self-imposed limitations and word spells thrown in as extra burdens. Breathe out. Silence, finally. Breathe in. Who am I? No, who am I really? So many masks, so many people, all rolled into a single chameleon. I learned to be who was demanded, a shapeshifter, different in home, family, work, church, and with each friend. Phase two, the struggle. Many traditions claim this is a lesson or a chain of related lessons or the universal mirror or claim it's karma or causality. I know many claim it's God's divine judgment and thus deserve. Cosmically, if it happens to be to a pious believer, it's a devil's oppression. In all cases, the struggle is a late major life event, often traumatic, and many smaller events leading to a These deeply touch my identity and everything I believe to be true, right, or just. The vase of life is shattered and shards so broken there's nothing to hold back the porcelain tears. Reality sits in. Oddly, it's much later in life that I began to understand that arguing with reality is a losing battle 100% of the time. Death of my father, my wife's miscarriage, her affair, separation, divorce, loss of friends. I was ostracized from a religious community, selling my house, loss of job then rejections, then finding a new job, financial debt, buying a new house, a mother with dementia. Breathe out. Jacob ran away and so did the prodigal son. I wanted to run, run away too. I was in DC, 200 miles from home, driving west and kept driving for nearly an hour to plan, stop by the bank, get some money, leave a voicemail, an abandoned house and all assets to my first wife, Another state, start over. I was overwhelmed, depressed, emotionally exhausted. Then it hit me. Maybe there was something I was missing. The mental recorder that played both day and night. I was 46. That list above, uh, that was four years of my life. For most everyone, the valley seems to come in the late 30s to late 40s. Breathe in, breathe out. Oh, too long. It took me a while before I was breathing regularly again and I could regain composure to meditate. Drifting, a recollection, on my knees be begging, let her return. Please make her see. God, are you there? This wasn't the deal. This wasn't the promise. It should be different. I followed the rules. Was an all over good guy, a solid worker, went to church, was a Sunday school teacher, a deacon servant, and a tithe giver giver. Do unto others right? I checked every box. My belief was simple. If I lived the rules, I'd receive the blessing. Oh, breathe in. Doesn't God, the universe, reward the good and punish evil?
Phase three, the decision. Who am I? After all the misfortune and all the achievements, am I what she says? Am I the lies they believe? Both? Am I any of this? It's all your fault? Are you angry and a verbal abusive man? The world spe spells, the word spells banged around my meditations for months, and I was relieved the film strip, I relived the film strip endlessly, day in and day out in my dreams. At 3 a.m., these were the first words remembered on my way to the bathroom and before attempting to return to sleep again. This word spell, along with the related traumas leading up to separation and divorce, resulted in years of insomnia. Rewrite. The words of a past lover cut deep. The spell took years of therapy to undo, trying to fix what wasn't broken. On my darkest day, the day I thought might be my last, the mental conflict, each inner voice was shouting and repeating a repeating voice in each word spell was strengthening by the retail telling and the daily cycle. I didn't need humans anymore. The word spell were so ingrained that I was perfectly capable of torturing myself with no one in my life. Live or leave, love or hate, yet. Yet there was a much deeper voice speaking to me, um, speaking to me. One I once knew, and I remember vaguely, like the smell of it, professional accol accolades, the awards, the interviews, all the times I taught Sunday school and Bible studies. What did it all mean? All that shit I have achieved. My resume, my stories, meaningless. Focus, breathe in, fill the belly. There are many names for the higher essence. God, Lord, Universe, Tao, Source, Spirit. For me, there's no word that seems to capture the truth. Each name tries to box the unboxable, bind the unbindable, and define the indefinable. For the last phase, please use the divine name that works for you. For me, Spirit works. Jake, Jacob wrestled with the angel. The prodigal son's epiphany occurred while feeding pigs. For me, I was crying, walking through an empty house. I cared for nothing. I wanted nothing. It was all so meaningless. Seek, and you will find. This idea, simple, among many related ones, filled my consciousness that day, and I made an odd decision. My blessed days, my most blessed days are ahead of me. Breathe out. Imagine after all those four horrible years dreaming of such an idea. Thank you, Spirit. Whether it's a sequence of smaller losses or a collapse of life, we each have a choice to choose a simple double down on identity and ego or open your heart and seek an essence greater than all the woes of life. Psalm 119, 105 states, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a life unto my path. I believe this is an essential prayer as the next step, a word. Surprisingly, a next step has always appeared, a bit, and it's often wait. Faith is a step beyond the light of the lamp. The journey transformed from my identity and ego focused slowly on destination, I call that destination thinking, into a step-by-step -step faith journey, reading the omens and signs along the way, a honeybee buzz it by, buzzes by. Breathe in, lavender. There's nothing equal to lavender on the bush. Memories rush forward, mistakes one after another. Those who have wronged me, everyone I blamed, each a past, a past tormentor. These reflection, these hungry ghosts appear much less these days, although a visit signals a word spell not fully broken and replaced by a new world spell attempting to take root. Life isn't fair. Good guy doesn't always win, and get the girl the cowboy doesn't always ride off in the sunset. Jacob returned home and was a set to his brother Esau. The prodigal was welcomed by his father with a ring, a robe, and a feast, and scorned by his brother. Maybe the brother who refused to celebrate his return was the true prodigal. You wait long enough, you'll see the heart of every person. It may take a half lifetime to even see your own heart. Breathe out one two, three, four, breathe in. So where are these days? Have you noticed that those elder 
later in life, bitter, angry, out of sorts with every detail of life. My speculation is they continue to double down on their identity and ego and refuse the signs, omens, and ultimately the spirit. If the chance for early life correction is ignored due to emotional identity or ego resistance, the chips keep stacking up, leading to greater carnage and regret later in life. Could they be living hell on earth? It was later when Jacob seemed to have his own God. It wasn't the God of his father, but his God. He earned spirit, or rather, he proved the existence of spirit through uh, trials and tribulation. And I believe this is the lesson. This is the template for life, that this journey of life repeated thread. Consider the prodigal brother's journey. Was he doubling down on his ego and identity? I'm humbled to report that those blessings did emerge, and for over a decade, I've been enjoying blessings and a loving partner, and all that has taken away was return and right relationship to spirit. I'm still seeking. I refer to myself as a mystic with a broad view of spirituality and a growing compassion. To close the story, let me ask a few questions. What phase are you in your journey? Identity and ego? Maybe it's the valley. Are you doubling down, looking for answers? I hope this chapter reminds you that you are human, living a human experience. Your ups and downs are real and normal. While the details differ, the journey is essentially the same. Your emotions are information, important signals, attempting to get your attention and slow down to smell that lavender. I do love lavender. Breathe out. Buzz, buzz, buzz. The bees know, you know. The practice. Allocate about two hours without any following planned activities. I recommend at least 30 minutes post-exercise bu buffer Specifically, so you can keep going as necessary. When initially starting, it's important not to be emotionally rushed by your next appointment. Find the quietest place possible. In nature, a park, quiet room, noise canceling headsets as a last resort. This initial work will take several sessions. Try not to feel rushed. Or rushed to another task is easy form of, of avoidance. My focus, I brew a small pot of tea, Bring a pen, a writing pad, and sit outside from all the distractions. Remember, it's a paper exercise, so turn off and store your computer and cell phone. Uh, no cheating on this. This will distract you from the full attention of initial recovery diagnosis. Double check. No cell phone, right? No dings, no alarms, right? Brain chatter is normal. Don't fret. Don't resist. Embrace the chatter. Today's to-do list, meetings, memories, anger, anything. Give yourself permission to attend to these later and write each on the pad as they appear. Start with a memory and let the chatter vomit onto the page with no editing. Write as fast as possible and let it all out. When your brain silences, get a red pen and try to summarize in a few words each section of blather. Perfection and precisions don't count. Just try to capture the basic idea in a word or two. Take a deep breath. Filling the lungs from the bottom to the top, let out a slow, long sigh through your mouth. Repeat the process two additional times. Place your hands on your heart. Take another slow, deep breath with a sigh. Let it out a few seconds longer than the inhale. And ask the following questions. What do I need to know? Give yourself time to hear the response. What is my next step? Give your time yourself time to hear the response. Don't be overly concerned if the chatter overwhelms uh, the direction. This process takes a few times to practice. Realize that wait might actually be the answer. Give yourself self sections, maybe a few weeks of a similar exercise. Also look for signals and omens specifically, anything that seems to align with your answers. If you're strong-willed, don't be surprised if you hear from yourself what you want to hear. Sometimes the will is so strong I've taken an action and failed before I could hear what was really being uh, taught. It may seem gratuitous to suggest that you take care of yourself. A wise friend taught me that the leading 
If leaning fence post falls first, don't neglect your daily practice. And this reading is the first step, so please visit my website for ideas and resources and send me a note on how it's going. Wow, prodigal son. The yeah, what, talk about, I, I really love all the allegories and metaphors and uh, and things that you brought into this. And it's just really a truly interesting and fascinating relating of, of your story, of your life story. And I, I like that you kind of jump around a little bit because, as you say, that's kind of what our minds do, you know? Yeah, one, one of the things that I find almost every new meditator is frustrated over is their mind won't settle. Right. And and it's it's common, and it, it almost always ends, I can't meditate, right? And when you dig deeper, like, well, my mind doesn't settle. And the story that you're hearing here was um, written uh, in a morning. Uh, I sat down to write the first draft of it. And, and some of the distractions that came up in memory actually made it into the story. So this was written and during a meditation, and some of the distractions were, were really came up during those stories. And that's really what meditation is. Some days you do get a little bit more quiet and peace, uh, but some days it's, it's chatty, and that's okay. That's, that's true for all meditators. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very, very powerful lesson and something that everybody can take to heart. And also uh, to understand that you're not the only one. The mind is a powerful thing. The mind, here's what, here's the way I think about it. Uh, I have come to the realization that thoughts are just energy forms. They just show up. And mentation is the process that I go through when I start entertaining those thoughts. And that's literally what it is, isn't it? It's like those thoughts come to a party and I'm entertaining them. <laughs> so if, as long as I decide, well, thank you for visiting. Now you can leave. If you, if you think about it that way from a, from a, from the perspective of all of your thoughts, it's much easier to stay grounded and centered. Thoughts are going to come into your mind. Just let them come in and then just watch them leave. You know, it's, it's, it's really quite beautiful when you do it that way and you understand that the purpose of meditation is not to stop thoughts. It's just simply to maybe have less, in, uh, less connection with them and more observation of them. Yeah, and, and IFS, I like kind of the way, um that system sort of thinks about it and that is that some of these thoughts are like stranded portions of your psyche and there's always yeah. a protector the protector is the one you know that's the one that's the one who's like really giving it to you and 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 really telling you what to do and and that kind of stuff but that protector is protecting part of you that's hurt and so meditation is one of the ways to calm down that protector at some point and get to the detail of hey what part of you is really hurt and why and, and that's where healing can come from. Um, and there's almost all traditions have some form of the same piece, but I like that idea that there's either a protector. And I think the other one he talks about is um, a firefighter. Got to go do it, got to run, got to push, got to do it. And so those two things tend to hide the thing that is protecting. Um, and so we find ourselves restless or angry, but behind that is a part of us that's hurting. And the goal, I think, of meditation and my daily practice, ultimately, and, and helping others is to, is to you know, identify some of those firefighters and protectors and try to get to that hurt person so that can, healing can happen. Because it can take a lifetime to heal right. if you put it yeah. off. You know, it takes longer. Yeah. The longer you put it off, the more stuff you got to heal. That's right. That's right. And isn't it funny how most of us want to avoid the healing and we will continue to, to avoid the healing until the need for healing becomes overwhelming. And then all of a sudden, it's like my entire life turns into a mess because I've been, I've been pushing it aside for way too long. Uh, that certainly yeah, happened to me. And it sounds like something similar happened to you. Absolutely. And that's the doubling down part of the process. You know, you're just throwing into identity, mm -hmm. you're pushing or you're pushing hard, you're pushing hard. And and sometimes it's a big brick wall. Sometimes it's a years like I experienced. And then at some point you're just, you know, you're just exhausted from life. 
and it's not meaningful anymore. You don't want to do it anymore. Maybe your spouse leaves and, and your friends kind of go away and you're trying to figure it out. And, um, that's where you start looking around. And, uh, I can tell you it's in every wisdom tradition. And so if this applies to anyone, you'll find it in your tradition. If you go look for it, it's, it's there everywhere. Right. Well, Frank, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and, and reading your chapter to us today. Blessings to you. Thank you for being here. And friends, I just want to say, there you go. Another wonderful example of the fantastic and inspiring material that's available to you in our book, Gifts of Wisdom. If you haven't already purchased a copy or if you'd like to consider giving one to one of your friends or somebody in your family, please head over to our Amazon book page and you can pick one up there. I've, I've included the link below here. Also, if you'd like to connect with Frank Byram directly, please reach out to him on his website at themindfulpathway.com. I've put that link in the, in, the, or in the screen below as well. Thank you all for dropping by. I hope to see you in all the other chapter readings that are part of this series. And I wish you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. So bye-bye for now. Thank you.